Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to our webinar on diagnostic decision support with Bayesian Networks and Bayesia Lab. It's a great pleasure to have you join us today. Let me start off by introducing myself. My name is Stefan Conradi and I'm the managing partner of Bayesia USA. So let me uh, perhaps tell you a little bit, of, little bit about our new webinar series. This is in fact the very first of a new webinar series that we launched after having hosted a whole lot of seminars that required um, physical in-person attendance. We had several hundred, actually close to a thousand participants over the last year or so. So now this marks the beginning of a new a series of webinars. Today, we're starting off with a diagnostic decision support. Next week, we will move on to unsupervised learning, exploring the 2016 general social survey, then returning to supervised learning on February 23rd, talking about predicting injury severity from automatic collision notification data. And then finally, uh, on March 2nd, we will go into a topic that doesn't require data at all. We will just try to reason with Bayesian networks just using our domain knowledge. Uh, another very interesting topic. In any case, um, please consider joining us for these seminars as well. So this is what we're going to talk about today. It should take roughly 60 minutes or so. We are already in the middle of the introduction. I'll tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. I'll address some frequently asked questions so you don't have to ask them. Um, I will talk about today's topic and provide a little bit of background on this, um, the topic being decision support for diagnosing coronary artery disease. And that part of the presentation, that part of the webinar will just be PowerPoint slides, but then we get into the workflow with Bayesia Lab. There I'll show you how to actually build a model and how we can use that for improving our diagnostic process. We will machine learn a model, we will use supervised learning, we will optimize that particular model, and then ultimately perform inference using the adaptive questionnaire. So now pretty much every other word I'm going to say today involves Bayes. So let me start off by clarifying this nomenclature a little bit. Bayesia, that's our company, that's who I work for. Bayesia Lab, that's our product, that's our technology, our software that we will see in practice today. And all this is based on the framework of Bayesian networks. And I'll talk about it a little bit more uh, later today. So our software really isn't just one individual program, rather it is an array of software packages that has evolved over nearly 20 years of development. In fact, it has evolved into a kind of ecosystem consisting of a desktop software, of web applications, and finally, uh, a set of APIs. But today, we are only going to talk about the, or we will see Bayesia Lab Professional and the Bayesia Lab Web Simulator. That will be our focus today. So uh, let me address some frequently asked questions. I have already seen a few of those coming through via the question panel. Yes, all the slides you see today will be available for download. Uh, as a follow-up email, you'll receive a download link. And that download link will also include a recording to this webinar. So you can relive this presentation as many times as you like. Also, and this is important, everything you see today, you can replicate on your own. So, so this is very much a how-to webinar. You can do that by downloading a trial of Bayesia Lab. There are two types of trials available, one that is more restricted, the demo version, and then a more unrestricted version that you can apply for. Uh, 
So, um, and but I'll return to that topic later. Now, if this is of interest to you in general, if you're interested in applying Bayesian networks in your own research, in your own studies, you may want to consider joining one of our seminars, our actually three-day courses. The next one being held in Dubai, followed by in March, in mid-March in San Francisco. Pretty much once a month, we are in a major city somewhere in the world. And those courses, they are hosted by one of the co-founders of Bayesia, Dr. Lionel Juve. Uh, they, they're a great way to really get, get going and immerse yourself into the Bayesia lab technology and how you can use it for your purposes. Now, um, you'll probably have many questions that I'm not going to address up front, so please put them all into the question panel that you should have on your screen. Just type it in. We will, however, probably not have time to address all these questions up front, or not up front, but rather during the webinar. Um, rather, we will respond individually and also make these all the answers available to everybody via our user forum. So, um, so even the questions you didn't ask, you will see the answers to everybody else's question on our website in the user forum. So let's now proceed to our topic of today. We want to talk about diagnostic decision support. And here I just need to add a caveat up front. Since this, this subject matter today is of medical nature, I want to point out that this is strictly for methodological illustration purposes. We're not making any claims. We're not providing any medical insights or healthcare advice. This is meant to be a prototypical example for diagnostic inference that you will hopefully find that it translates into many other uh, problem domains as well. And I know, I think we have several physicians on the call and at least one cardiologist. So, so I'll try to be very, very careful so I'm not making any false statements as I'm describing the background of this domain. And really the background I think is just important and helpful to understand why we're doing this and why we're implementing certain learning techniques and inference techniques. Makes much more sense than if we just presented an abstract example without any backstory. Anyway, here is the story for today. We want to talk about coronary artery disease. I'm sure you've heard about it. Uh, many people are affected by it. It's also known as ischemic heart disease or ischemia. And it all relates to problems with the blood supply to the human heart. And as you probably know, it's one of the most common causes of death in Western countries. So it's, it's really a worthwhile topic to explore. Now, for our purposes today, we're going to define coronary artery disease as follows. And um, here I need to go into a little bit more details. You see a, an illustration of a human heart on this slide, and the labels here refer to three types of arteries, the right coronary artery, the acronym is RCA, the left circumflex artery, LCX, and finally, the left anterior descending artery, LAD. For our purposes today, we are looking or we are saying someone has coronary artery disease, if any of these, if any one of these three arteries is blocked by 50% or more. The technical term for that blockage is stenosis. Now, there is a gold standard for, for diagnosing coronary artery disease, and that is performing an angiography or an angiogram. And here you see an image that was generated through this procedure, and you can very nicely see the stenosis that affects one of these arteries. 
even though it looks like a fairly straightforward x-ray image, it's actually quite involved to produce that, to obtain such an image. So in fact, it requires that a catheter is either inserted through your leg or through your arm, pushed all the way through close to the heart, and then some contrast dye is injected into your heart vessels and um, so that the x-ray machine can, can capture that, that contrast and so any stenosis will become visible on the x-ray image. So that's the process in very, very simple terms. And as you can imagine, there is a cost associated with that. I just Googled it. In fact, you can shop around for that procedure. So we're looking at thousands and thousands of dollars for such a procedure. Given that cost, it's um, you know not not a not a super easy decision just to say, oh, let's let's do that. So there have been numerous initiatives to look at predicting coronary artery. Uh, disease instead of through an angiography, but rather to see whether any other symptoms, measures, metrics could help understand whether a patient is affected or not. And so um, going through the literature, there are many examples, and they were all about using patient data, symptoms, comorbidities, it's all about predicting coronary artery disease. We will have a slightly different focus today, and that is we don't just want to predict yes or no whether a patient suffers from coronary artery disease, but rather what we want to do, we want to quantify the uncertainty. We want to know how certain are we with our prediction in terms of the diagnosis. So is it necessary or not to perform the angiography? So that's what we want to explore today. So, so uncertainty and quantifying uncertainty will be quite central to our task. So the data sets that we will utilize to illustrate this is known as the Z Eliza De Sani data set. You may have seen that in various libraries for machine learners where, uh, uh, where this is used as a prototypical example for training machine learning algorithms. We, however, we are not using the original data set that you may see posted in many places. Rather, we're going to use the extended data set. So the original data set uh, was based on 303 patients. And in, uh, with these patient records, there were features that included demographic data, patient history, the results from a physical examination, results from an ECG, laboratory, laboratory data, and then finally, the results of an echocardiogram. So that was in the original data set. In the extended data set, we additionally have also the information about the stenosis of the individual variables or the individual arteries. In the original data set, there was only information about whether coronary artery disease was present or not as established through an angiogram. So in that sense, I think the extended data set will be a little bit more interesting for our purposes. Now here are all the variables. We don't have to go through them. However, you will have this slide in your slide deck and these all these variables will reappear as we as we machine learn a network and we will see how we can use them to predict whether or not somebody has coronary artery disease. Just to give you a sense of the degree of uncertainty we have, uh, we can look at the marginal distribution of these individual variables in our data set. And since this was done by a, an imaging department in a hospital in the cardiology department, um, not surprisingly, a significant number of patients who 
who went there actually did have this disease. And so you can see how the distribution of uh, normal versus stenotic conditions uh, applies here to this, to, to, this, uh, to this population, to this patient population of this particular hospital. So now the question is, how can we more formally deal with this? Uh, because I said earlier, we want to get into, we want to quantify uncertainty. Well, the question is, how can we quantify uncertainty? So I need to briefly make an excursion into the field of information theory and quote Claude Shannon here, who said, or at least it has been attributed to him, that information is the resolution of uncertainty. And we quite literally want to use that today. We want to figure out how we can seek information about the patient from the patient to reduce our uncertainty regarding the underlying condition. Now, there is a way to very formally quantify to measure uncertainty, and that happens through the concept of entropy or as a, as a measure. And it is computed here with this famous formula, uh, minus P log P. And you don't need to remember that. I just want to give you a little bit of intuition of um, what, that, what, that practically, what that practically means. And so I now want to compute the, um, the uncertainty of our distribution of the of the diagnosis of the marginal distribution of our di diagnosis from our entire patient population here this is our target variable um, it's abbreviated as cath meaning it refers to the result from the cardiac catheterization meaning uh, the results from the from the angiogram. And so here we see 71% of patients indeed do have coronary artery disease. And if we plug these distributions into this formula, we can compute the entropy of, or can compute the entropy and the value is 0.86. Now on its own, that isn't particularly meaningful. Rather, we need to put this in context and think about what would be the maximum uncertainty. And that would be if the diagnosis, if either diagnosis would be equally probable. So if we had just a 50-50 distribution for normal versus coronary artery disease. If we plug in these dis this distribution into our formula, then we arrive at the entropy of one, which for this distribution would be the maximum value. Conversely, if we have the results, if we know it is either normal or coronary artery disease is present, then the entropy would be zero. So this is now the range between the minimum and the maximum entropy against which we can compare the marginal entropy. This is now the degree of uncertainty we have before we actually look at the patient. If we had a patient walk through the door before we know anything about him or her, this would be the degree of uncertainty we should have. However, we're not going to use that uncertainty on its own or the measure of entropy on its own, rather, we now want to look at entropy in the context of also observing another variable or more than just one variable. So here, just for illustration purposes, I am looking at how the uncertainty of coronary artery disease changes if we observe the value of uh, what's here abbreviated as ESR, which reflects erythrocyte sedimentation. I can barely pronounce that, but that means it's a rate of sedimentation of your red blood cells in, in a sample. So what, what we are now looking at here is we want to see what is the conditional distribution of our target variable, cath, 
given that we observe ESR. So here, we're just going through different values of ESR, everything that we can, that this variable can take on, and then look at the corresponding distributions of cath, and then once again, compute the entropy that is associated with each of these states. And then we can take the weighted average of these values, and that gives us the conditional entropy of cath given ESR. So even that we're not going to use on its own, rather we're now taking the marginal entropy that we computed earlier, subtracting from it the conditional entropy that we computed just now, and that gives us the mutual information denoted by I. Yeah, And that is a very powerful and useful quantity because that tells us how much information these two variables, CAF and ESR, have in common. What I should point out here in this context is that this is a measure is symmetrical. Mutual information is always symmetrical, so it tells us how much CAF has in common with ESR and vice versa. So, so it just tells us, tells us how much information these two variables have in common. So we're now going to look at how can we utilize such a measure as we build a model. Because this probably, if you come from a traditional statistical background, may not seem to be a familiar measure. However, there is a modeling framework where mutual information can be very directly and intuitively used, and that is the framework of Bayesian networks. Bayesian networks were invented by Professor Judea Pearl, who's been teaching and researching at UCLA since 1970. And really, the way he puts it, his principal objective behind inventing Bayesian networks was to mathematize causality. He realized early on that algebra as we know it is really quite limited in terms of encoding causal relationships. So that was the principal driver for inventing Bayesian networks. But actually today we're not going to use them for that application in a way where you're going to use Bayesian networks for their side benefits. So, and we can now spend quite a bit of time just talking about theory, about what exactly Bayesian networks are, what their mechanics are, et cetera. Uh, we don't have time for that. Rather, I would like to refer you to our book, which you can download for free. In the first few chapters, in the first three chapters, if you go through them, you should get a quick and good sense about um, you know, how Bayesian networks actually work and how you can utilize them. What I want to focus on today is how we can take this mathematical formalism of Bayesian networks and translate that into a research software or more importantly, into a research workflow. Now, there are two principal ways of how Bayesian networks can be generated. One would be strictly using domain knowledge, um, just using what we know about a domain and directly encoding it. That's, however, not what we're going to do today. Rather, we're looking at this alternative approach to building Bayesian networks, and that is by performing knowledge discovery and machine learning. So that's what we want to do. And then once we have our Bayesian network representing the problem domain, then we can use that for decision support purposes. And our specific objective is to use this the Bayesian network that we generate for diagnostic purposes. So, and um, how are we going to do that? That's, of course, where our software comes in, Bayesia Lab. That's a desktop software package that allows us to learn Bayesian networks, to edit them, to perform inference, to analyze, simulate, all on the basis of Bayesian networks. But what I should emphasize here is 
the lab part. It's really a laboratory for your problem domain. So you can encode your entire problem domain and then work it backwards and forwards until you have an understanding of what is going on. So let's shift to the practical part. Here's now the workflow that we're going to go through. I will start off with a quick correlation analysis just to tie some of our thoughts back to traditional statistical approaches. But then we will go into Bayesian networks in Bayesian lab. We will take this data that I referred to earlier. We will import it. We will do all kinds of analysis steps. But really, it all focuses on performing supervised learning, learning a model that we can subsequently interpret. So uh, let me perhaps present this. Or you may ask, well, you know, uh, why don't we use correlation? It's such a familiar measure. Uh, why do we have to depart and go into information theory? Everybody knows correlation. Indeed, uh, we could perform a correlation analysis here. In fact, I've done it here for all the 54 variables and our target node, uh, Cath. Now, one of the constraints, however, is that we are constrained to relationships between numerical variables, and we can only quantify relationships between variable pairs. And perhaps more importantly is correlation makes an assumption about a linear relationship. And here I've just picked out the relationship between the variable age and the probability of coronary artery disease. And here we see that that relationship is not linear. So, and in fact, when we look at many of the variables involved in this system, and here I've just plotted the relationship between all 54 variables and the target variable uh, coronary artery disease. Just looking at this plot tells us a lot here is nonlinear, so we can't really use correlation to quantify this properly. So, which brings us back to, well, can't we use mutual information, the quantity that we computed earlier, wouldn't that be a useful quantity since that makes no such assumptions about linearity? It's not restricted to numerical variables. Indeed, that's what we're going to use now. And I'm, I'm still staying here on the exploratory analysis side for a moment. Um, I'm now, this, this is generated through Bayesian lab, but we will just use this and interpret this qualitatively. What I'm showing here is what we call a distance mapping using mutual information. And in this case, we see how all the variables are positioned in such a way that the distance between the variables is proportional to the mutual information between them. So this really helps us to get a sense of, well, is this plausible? Are these, you know, the relationships, the proximity between them, does this make sense? Especially if a physician or a cardiologist looks at this, you can kind of do a sanity check. What is important here to point out, um, mutual information does not reflect the sign of the relationship. So some variables that are close together, they could have a strongly negative relationship. So that we cannot read from mutual information. So at a later point, we will bring back correlation to give us that information. So, so much for, um, for kind of the, the prelude. Let me now shift gears and talk about supervised learning. But before we, can, before we can actually use that, we need to talk about how Bayesian Lab will generate a model or how it goes about machine learning a model from the data we have. When I say learning, what I really mean is Bayesian Lab needs to search 
for a possible model that fits the data. And let me illustrate how difficult that actually is to find a model. And the difficulty is there is, could be so many possible models out there. So um, let me illustrate this here. If we just had two variables, N1 and N2, there would be three possible networks that we could find. First one is no arc between them. The second one arc from N1 to N2. And then finally, the third arc or the third relationship in arc from N2 to N1. Very simple, two nodes, three possible networks. Now, if we had three nodes, three variables, there would be 25 possible networks that we could find. Now, in our case, we have 54 nodes. Actually, not that's not quite correct. We have, if we include the target variable, we have 55. And look at this number, 1.1 times 10 to the 459th. That is a way beyond astronomical number, meaning we could never possibly try out all the feasible networks. So that's the big challenge that Bayesia Lab faces. We cannot explore the entire space of possible networks that could fit the data. Rather, we need to cleverly search a subspace and within that find a good model. Now, that begs the question, what, what is a good model? How can we you know, know that a model is good when we look at one? So what Bayesian Lab does, it uses a score. It uses what is known as the minimum description length score that assesses each candidate network with regard to that, um, to its characteristics. And two aspects are measured in this context. The first one is uh, we are computing, or rather Bayesian Lab is computing or quantifying the complexity of the network. That is done with use or computing the description length of the Bayesian network. And secondly, Bayesian Lab computes the fit of the network to the data, and that is calculated as the description length of the data given the Bayesian network. And then both of these quantities are added up, and together they form the minimum description length score. That is what is measured, what is computed for each candidate network. There's one thing uh, I should point out here, and that is in this approach, we as the analysts, the researchers, we can put our thumb on that scale and influence the search in terms of looking for a more complex or perhaps a simpler network. And that happens through this structural coefficient alpha. By default, it is one, equally weighting the complexity and the fit. But as we will see later on, in our, as we learn our first model, we will explore different values for that to, to see whether we can improve on the model. But this is really quite, quite basic in the sense because this principle applies really to any modeling we would do. You know, when regardless of whether we build a regression or any other type of model, we're trying to have the best model, best predictive performance with the simplest possible structure. So um, let's now actually do that. Um, let me now switch gears and um, leave PowerPoint and start up Bayesian Lab. Let me make sure I'm doing this correctly here and that you see the appropriate screen. Yes, now I've started up Bayesian Lab. You should see a big blue screen. This is the starting screen for Bayesian Lab. And now I want to import the original data from the hospital's data set with all the 303 patients. I go to data, open data source, and then select the file that I'm looking for, which we see here. And 
This is the first step of our data import wizard. It gives me a table-like preview of all the variables that we have. I can scroll through them here and see all, all the variables. Basically, our app looks at these variables and guesses whether these variables reflect categorical or numerical values. For the most part, Bayesian Lab guessed here correct. I will make one adjustment, and that is these variables here. I will switch over to continuous because um, you'll, you'll see the reasoning in a, in a little bit. So that's the first step of the data import wizard. I continue on. This step is about missing values processing, which is a hugely important topic. Luckily, we don't have to deal with that today uh, we, because we don't have any missing values in this particular data set. But very often, most real world data sets do have missing values, and we could now for hours talk about that. I would like to refer you to, I believe it is chapter nine in our book, there we talk about missing values processing in detail. Now, one thing we must do is we need to determine how to discretize our distributions, our, the distributions of our continuous variables. And for illustration purposes, I'm highlighting here the distribution for the body mass index. And this is what it looks like. And um, if I now had domain knowledge, I could manually introduce certain thresholds. I believe there are actually certain, certain thresholds that distinguish between uh, overweight and obese and so on. I don't know what these, what these thresholds are, but I could now manually enter them here and and tell Bayesian Lab how to discretize variables. This is very practical when we have quantities that have a physical meaning or are established as, as thresholds. Here, I don't have that. And so what I will do, I will ask Bayesian Lab to discretize all my variables using the R-squared genetic optimization algorithm. That is an algorithm that is trying to bin all our variables in a way that we minimize the quantization error. So let me do that. Let me run that. And so we've just imported all our 54 variables, actually plus four our, our diagnostic variables. Now, each variable that was originally in the table is now represented as a blue bubble, as a blue node. Let me now add some further information, and that is, um, since many of you, including myself, are not from the medical field, I will add a dictionary that gives us more comprehensive variable names. So we can see that, for instance, um, DM stands for diabetes mellitus, HTN stands for hypertension, and so on. So I can turn and on and off these extended variable names as I need them. Furthermore, I will import a dictionary that assigns classes to these variables. And these classes are helpful because they allow me to color code these variables so I can distinguish kind of the source of the information. Here, for instance, the red nodes reflect um, patient demographics and patient history. Then the yellow ones refer to the results from the physical examination. Blue ones are from the ECG. And then finally, the pink ones are both laboratory results and um, insights from the echocardiogram. And then finally, the green ones, they are our diagnosis variables, the, the ground truth variables, LAD, LCX, RCA, and CATH. So um, now we're almost ready for learning, but we want to learn our first model just using the CATH the overall variable that represents coronary artery disease. 
I will highlight that variable as a target node and exclude, oops, wrong button here, um, and exclude the other diagnostic variables. We will, we will come back to those later on. Furthermore, I will set aside a test set. Hold on. I will create, I will split off a, a test set from our learning data set. So we have a holdout sample against which we can test out the performance of the model we are about to learn. Okay, now we are ready to learn our first model. I'm going into the learning menu, scrolling down to supervised learning. And from there, I'm selecting without further comment the augmented Markov blanket. That's a very universal learning algorithm. And for me, it's often the starting point before I kind of go further and explore other possibilities. One thing I should point out that we can also perform unsupervised learning. That would be learning or using a learning algorithm between all variables, where we just want to see the relationship between everything. But here we have a very specific target. We want to perform unsupervised learning with regard to the target node, Cath. So let me run that. It shouldn't take very long, and here it is. We've just learned our first model, and the resulting network, in a way, presents a variable selection to us. Uh, we now see what variables are involved. And of course, the first thing I want to know is, well, how well does, does this model perform? I go into the analysis mode and select network performance and target because I want to see how well does this, uh, does this network, does this model predict our target node. And here are the results. I get a whole lot of measures here. And um, now I've, I've selected multiple acceptance thresholds that we can use here. So let's see what will I use. I will perhaps use this one here. Um, the rock curve in this regard is very, very helpful because it allows me to trade off false positives and true positives. And um, those we can also see here in the confusion matrix at the center of the screen where, and perhaps I can also annotate this here, uh, where here we have the sensitivity and here we have the specificity of the model, 87 and 85% respectively, giving us an overall precision of 86% that is also known as accuracy. As it turns out, this model that we just learned in a few seconds is as good as the models that have been learned in literature. And so we could say, wow, this is actually pretty useful and, and um, good already, and we, can, we could proceed. Yes, we can, but we want to see whether we can perhaps improve this model a little bit further. And Bayesian Lab offers us a tool in this context, and that is what we call the structural coefficient analysis. You may recall a few minutes ago, I mentioned the structural coefficient alpha that allows us to experiment with different levels of complexity. We can put our thumb on the scale. Now we want to utilize that and, and try out different, or learn multiple networks, each at a different level of complexity, to see whether we can squeeze out somewhat better performance of this model. Perhaps we can get to 90% accuracy or more. So let's see what we can do here. Let me run this. So Bayesian Lab now learns 10 models, one each at uh, by basically dividing a range of structural coefficient into 10 steps and learning a model for each of these steps. Now, there, there would be a lot to say about this particular uh, 
plot. It's very, very useful because it helps us establish how far we can lower the structural coefficient before we get into overfitting. That's obviously one thing we always need to bear in mind because um, as we lower the structural coefficient, the network becomes more complex. Um, if we were to set it to zero, we would end up with a fully connected network. And that, of course, would be completely overfitted and would ter have terrible out of sample performance. So here I'm plotting two things. The, the red line that you see here, perhaps I can also highlight this by hovering. The, the red line shows us the structure to data ratio. And the rule of thumb is that we, um, that we try to stay to the right of the in, inflection point. Stay to the right, oops, this is not what I intended. Stay to the right of this area here. Secondly, the other variable, the other measure that I've plotted is the target precision. This is shown here as a normalized basis. And we can see the target precision or accuracy is fairly level across a range of structural coefficients but then it drops off. There we see the out of sample performance declines, which gives me kind of or what, what how I would judge this now is like, we should probably stay to the right of, of this line, uh, perhaps to the right of a structural coefficient of 0.4. So, so we can stay safe and avoid overfitting. So, with that, let me erase all markings and close this. This this is really a tool we always use. And once you start using Bayesian Lab, you'll see that becomes part of every workflow. So let me change the structural coefficient now to the level that I have just determined and relearn our network. So, and um, the learning is completed, was very quick again. And you can see we've now found additional relationships. And once again, we can evaluate whether this model is any better than what we had before. Uh, let me do this again and select. And in fact, even though we have pushed to complexity, we don't, we can now trade off uh, sensitivity and specificity a, a little bit further depending on how we're going to use this model. And that, as a clinician, one would have very certain requirements or would have certain consideration what it means to miss out a truly positive diagnosis as opposed to misdiagnosing someone who does not have coronary artery disease. But that's beyond the scope of our analysis here. We just want to establish, we want to quantify our degree of uncertainty for with regard to the diagnosis. Now, um, so, so both models that we've learned so far perform pretty well. Perhaps the first one is slightly better than the, the second one. But our ultimate objective today isn't just predicting. We want to figure out how can we provide assistance in the diagnostic process? How can we help a doctor to seek out the appropriate next piece of observation with the objective of reducing our uncertainty regarding the diagnosis. So a model that only involves a small subset of variables isn't really appropriate here. Rather, I'm going to say is, I want to see how I can potentially use all these variables in a network. So I can utilize each node for whatever it's worth, whatever I can observe about the patient, let me use um, let me use that information. So for that purpose, I'm now going to learn 
an augmented uh, an um, augmented naive Bayes network. And as I was saying that, the learning is already completed. And of course, what we're looking at right now looks quite messy. So I will momentarily rearrange that. And I think for our purposes now, a radial layout will, will look very appropriate. So let me um, rearrange that. And now we have this circular arrangement. Perhaps I'll move it a little bit into the center of the screen. We have the circular arrangement of all our variables that we could observe for each patient. And we also see the relationships. We see the relationships between each variable and the target node, but we can also see what relationships may exist between them. Not surprisingly, there are relationships between these variables. Let me now try to understand in a, in a more quantitative way, what can we learn from them? What information do these variables in fact provide with regard to the target node? And for that, I'm moving into the mapping function that I've just opened up here. And this mapping function allows us to visualize certain measures in terms of the color, the size of the nodes, and the arc thicknesses. So the first thing I've done, I've assigned mutual information to the size of the nodes. So the, the size of the nodes is now proportional to the information they provide with regard to the target node cath, whether or not the patient has coronary artery disease. Secondly, and I think this will be interesting, I am now bringing back Pearson correlation that shows me what is actually the sign of the relationship between these variables. And not surprisingly, you know, um, we, we see relationships here between diabetes mellitus and blood sugar, we see relationships between weight and body mass index. Um, again, this gives us an opportunity to do a sanity check. Are the relationships that we have visualized here, are they in sync with our domain knowledge? And perhaps as a newcomer to this field, I would perhaps now see things that I, that I di didn't realize that uh, somebody who's perhaps studying this subject for the first time will discover and then uh, realize what it means. So, but this is really just a qualitative assessment. What we want to do now, how can we really use this to guide a clinician step-by-step -step through towards a diagnosis? So for that, I'm bringing up what we call the adaptive questionnaire. And this, um, what this does is that Bayesian Lab now computes in which order we should seek our observations. Where so should a clinician start with collecting information with the objective of reducing our uncertainty of the target node in the quickest possible way. So here now, from the top down, here at the very top, I see my target node, cath, representing whether or not the patient has coronary artery disease. And then I see step after step, each of the recommended diagnostic steps. So first thing here, what Bayesia Lab says, we should check whether the patient has chest pain, and I'm now making up uh, my observations. I'm examining a hypothetical, a fictional patient. I'm saying he doesn't have chest pain. Given that first observation, I now get an update for coronary artery disease. In fact, the probability has gone down. Next thing would be age. Let me set that to under 53. And once again, I get an update. And now the probability of coronary artery disease has declined further to 22.8%. Next thing is, an, uh, I think, uh, a result from the echocardiogram, 
as that set that to zero, now we're down to 16%. Okay, now it looks like with what we've observed so far, it looks like the, the patient may, may not really need a, a further diagnosis. If, if things line up the way we now see them evolve, perhaps we can send him home without going to an expensive angiography. But let's check the next measure. And I'm now pretending T inversion was observed. And that really changes the picture. Now I've observed a piece of evidence that is not consistent with what I've observed so far. So probability of coronary artery disease has gone up. Furthermore, I'm observing the patient has hypertension. So the probability is now gone up to 75% again. And each time I set a piece of evidence, Bayesian Lab recomputes the optimal order in which I should seek my next best piece of evidence. Uh, this is very helpful because depending on what I just observed, the next thing I should know may be something different. So this evolves as I am observing my, my pieces of evidence about the patient. So this is an interactive way of doing it. And in a few moments, I will publish this model to the web. So now anybody around the world who wanted to use this diagnostic tool, they could just log on to a website and then utilize this just, we, just like I did it right now. But sometimes we don't have the luxury of sitting in front of a computer and interactively typing in observations. So one thing I will produce here is what we call a target interpretation tree. And sometimes they can become quite large. That in a way is a static version of the adaptive questionnaire that we just saw. It gives us a kind of a, in, in a on a map, kind of an optimal, a static optimal sequence in which I should seek out my observations. So I, I would start at the top here. Perhaps I can mark this up again. Uh, we start here at the top. Chest pain, yes or no. If I say no, I'm going down this path. Next question is regarding age. Now, uh, if I set age to the highest level, I would arrive at this node. And at each step, I see what my current probability of coronary artery disease is. You see these, these little bar charts, they indicate where we currently stand. And then um, you can also kind of look ahead and, and, and see whether there is any observation out there that could turn around your current expectation. So sometimes this can be a very, very helpful tool. Now we're starting to run out of time. So I will, um, I think I will now return to PowerPoint and just give you a sense of what this web simulator that I just referred to would look like in practice. Hold on, here we go. I've just taken a screenshot here, but you can now go to this web simulator and experiment with that yourself. So we can directly publish this out of Bayesian Lab, enter our observations, and then perform inference, get an update on the probabilities. So with that, let me just um, conclude my presentation for today. I'm almost on time. If you're interested about in using Bayesian Lab for yourself, uh, you can learn about pricing, all possible licensing configurations that exist, academic, commercial, perpetual, pay by the hour. There are many, many ways of how you could utilize Bayesian Lab for your own purposes. You can also go on our web store where you could directly license Bayesian Lab straight away. Uh, you can learn about all the different configurations. And as I said earlier, you can, uh, or rather all the questions that have come in over the last hour, we will post uh, 
or rather the answers to all these questions, we will post on our community forum. So you can see what, what we've answered to your question, but also to all the others. One last thing I want to mention, and that is we have an annual conference, an annual Bayesia Lab conference. Last year, it was in Paris. It was a very glamorous event. Uh, this year, it will be in Chicago, in downtown Chicago, just a block off Michigan Avenue. This is a great opportunity to meet many Bayesia Lab users around the world from very different backgrounds, everything from military to cancer research, marketing science. It's a very, very broad spectrum. So, um, and you will you will see, yeah, here are the use cases from, from many different industries. So uh, please put it on your calendar. It would be great to meet you there in person. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for your interest this afternoon. Uh, I look forward to answering all your questions. If you have, would like to know anything else, please feel free to reach out to us, connect with, with us on Facebook, on LinkedIn, or send us directly your questions via email. With that, thanks again, and have a great weekend.